Hello people and welcome to the last lecture of this course. Today we are going to talk about microfluidics. So, first of all, why you want to use microfluidics? For sensors that's quite easy because we are using less reagents, less analytes, less volume, and those are really thin microfluidics channel in which you can have a really high uh, sensitivity to your analyte. You can do a lot of different things, but today we are focusing mostly on the fabrication and which kind of microfluidics um, you can make. If you look at the field of microfluidics and you look at the paper that have been published in the last 10-20 years, you can see that the field is super broad. You can move from physics to chemistry to synthesis, so part of organic chemistry, but also bioengineering, chemical engineering, a lot of different fields are actually moving towards microfluidics. How to make those microfluidics? Let's start with the easy one, um, that are glass microfluidics. This lecture works in this way. I will present you four different methods of making microfluidics and I will ask you which one do you think are the pros and which ones are the cons about each single fabrication method. Then on Friday we will discuss, and this one practically will be the last slide of the course. So the comparison between the four different methods and when you should use one compared to another. Uh, first method, it's glass microfluidics. <clears throat> glass microfluidics are those small devices. Um, you can just buy them and most of the time you are using them with something that can close them and you can make the connection with uh, your chip. So something like this, you close it and then you make the connection with the fluidics, so with the tubing. From this distance you can definitely not see them, so I will put the macro lens and we take a deeper look at this. All right, as you can see here, those are the glass microfluidics. You can still barely see them. This one is obviously the broken one. Let me check with the other lens. And now you can definitely see them. So this one was the Y channel so this one is for two different inlets then you have this one for a long reaction and then you have one outlet this is how it looks like and this is obviously the broken one so this one was a droplet generator so you can see the internal part, this one is for making small droplets. And broken. Those microfluidics, so the glass microfluidics are um, extremely stable to, for example, solvents. You can use organic solvents. Um, they can be super small. And the problem of those is that you can rarely do it in the lab. So the things that you usually do, uh, it's by them. And if you want your special design, you want to make the design yourself, then you need to send the design to someone that can produce them. It will take a couple of weeks, if not more, and then they are extremely expensive because they have to produce it for you. So if you want to have your own design, uh, this is not the way to go. And the other problem, as probably you can see here, they are obviously fragile. So it means that you can break them uh, quite easily, honestly. Those are usually done by etching the glass. So make the channel and then attach another piece of glass on top. That's the standard way of making the glass microfluidics. First one. So think about the pros and the cons of having glass microfluidics. Then the field of microfluidics really exploded when you gave the possibility to scientists to make their own design. And this was mostly due to white sites 
who is one of the highest cited scientists in the world. And you can see that after he developed this method, which is called replica molding, the field practically exploded. Because it's easy, you can do it in the lab, you can make your own design, and then you can make your microfluidics. How to do this? Um, how to do this? First of all, the material that he used was PDMS, and he used PDMS because it's quite similar to glass. So the refractive index is very close, so it's really transparent. The chemistry is also very similar, so you can use still salinization for making uh, reactive surfaces. And it's, it's very similar to glass, but it's flexible. That's also another important point. How to make them? So this method, that it's the replica molding, it's part of PDMS and part of glass. So you want to have your open channel on PDMS and then you seal them with glass. So for making this, uh, this is why it's called replica molding actually, uh, you need a master. So a master is something that we have seen with the transistor. So I have a surface, I have something on top of the surface, I put my PDMS on top, cure it, remove it, now I have grooves on the PDMS, and this PDMS then I will attach it on glass. For making the master, it's still lithography method, and it's exactly the same of uh, the transistor, the, the methodology for making transistor that we have seen. So you are spinning a substrate on top of a wafer, you use a mask for curing it, you remove the rest that it's uncured, and now you have the positive part on the master. For doing this, you not really need a clean room. Most of the time, if you want to go really low in a metaphoric channel, you need a clean room because, again, if you have one speck of dust, it's completely clogging your channel. And you can see here, again, you put your PDMS, which is a liquid, you put it in the oven, it cures, so it means it cross link. You can peel it off from your master, and then you must seal it on top of the glass. This is done um, with, plasma, um, with plasma cleaning. So when you put the PDMS on glass, it will be covalently attached there. And this is important because you don't want to delaminate. If I put just a piece of plastic on top of glass, it will just, I mean, you can just remove it. This, in this case, the idea that he had was that it's covalently attached. The covalently attached works with the plasma, so I'm oxidizing both surfaces, uh, the, both the glass and the PDMS are now reactive uh, hydroxyl group. When I put them together and put them in the oven, then I will form another silyl ether for um, for the bond between them. So now they are covalently attached. This looks like, pick up one, this one. So this is quite big because we had connection on top, but you can see the, the top part is PDMS, which is transparent, and the bottom part is glass. And if I try to remove them, I cannot because they are covalently attached. Also in this case, I will put lens, the macro lens, and we will take a deeper look at this. PDMS on glass, and let me see if you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. This is a Y channel. And again, I can put pressure, but I cannot remove this um, PDMS from top of the glass, from the top of the glass. This is because it's covalently attached. This is one. And as you can see, I need to save them, otherwise the glass will break. So also in this case, you see two inlets, two inlets and one outlet. Uh, let me check again. And this is how it looks like. The nice thing of those is that you can use the bottom part for uh, using the microscope. So as the bottom is glass, I can use those light directly on top of the microscope.
and that was microfluidics. Uh, sorry, PDMS on top of glass. Also in this link, you can see how um, the full fabrication works. Because again, this one you can do it in the lab. So this one, it's a standard lab and you can do it in standard lab. And you can see this video, uh, in this video, how they do it. And this is PDMS glass microfluidics. What do you think are the pros and what do you think are the cons? After this, I told you that the glass reacts, or actually the PDMS reacts more or less as the glass. So the next idea was, okay, why I cannot just attach PDMS on PDMS? And attaching PDMS on PDMS, it means now that I have a very flexible material. I don't have the glass anymore. It's not fragile anymore. And I can have something more interesting because both materials, so at the end it will be one material, it's flexible. And this is extremely important if you're thinking about organ on a chip. Most of the cells don't like to be on glass. They like to move a little bit, to stretch a little bit, especially if you're talking about, for example, lungs. If you're talking about muscle cells, they don't like that much uh, glass or stiff material. They want to have some, um, some flexible material. This video, for example, it's explaining how the lungs on the ship works. And for giving you a fast introduction, it works on two different chambers. So one will be the oxygen and the other one will be cell. And in the, in the middle, you have a membrane. And uh, you can stretch this material in all the direction. So when you are stretching, you can check um, the air versus the epithelium so that it's the part in the middle and on the lung cells. But please see this video because it's extremely interesting and I think it was the first uh, flexible organ on a chip. Another interesting thing of having PDMS on PDMS is that again, it's stretchable. So now I can use it for sensor, for example, on skin because I don't have glass anymore. I can stretch, I can bend and nothing happens to the microfluidics. This is, for example, one sensor that you can put on skin and it will um, detect different analytes in sweat. I will also link this paper um, here in the video or on Brightspace. And you can see how interesting have, is now to have a um, sensor, a wearable sensor. We will talk about wearable sensor a lot in nanomedicine in the next course. But just for giving you an idea how interesting it is to have PMS, PDMS, just take a look at this paper. Another super interesting thing, um, if you have PDMS and PDMS, is the field of soft robotics. So if I'm using now materials with two different stiffness, but still bendable, I can have movement. So for example, if I have something on the bottom which is kind of rigid, but still flexible, and on top something extremely flexible, I can flex this one and this one will bend a little bit. This is the field of soft robotic. This one I think was the first actuator ever done and it works um, with the stiff material on the bottom and on the soft material on top. And if, I apply like, if, and if I apply pressure, air pressure on the top, this one will bend. There are no hard parts in this soft robotic. This is why it's called soft robotics. It's practically indestructible. So you can drive a car on it, it will not break. So you can have actuators that are extremely strong and flexible, but you can have also something like a soft robotics, which will mimic the heart movement. Those ones are also videos that you should watch because they are extremely interesting. And lately, um, this field is moving in everything 3D printable, so which you can 3D print the full, um, the full soft robotics but also inside you can have chemicals that when they react, they will make pressure because they will evolve um, carbon dioxide or other gases, so you can have move. This is one of the example of those soft robotics. So this is part of PDMS PDMS. So I'm using the same methodology I use for PDMS class, but I have PDMS PDMS. Again, pros and cons. Think about them. Naturally, when the 3D printer started to be a little bit better, we had uh, 3D printed microfluidics like this one. 
And this one maybe you can see it. This is a 3D printed microfluidics. It's in art plastic. It's somehow transparent. It's not really transparent, but all the materials for 3D printer are um, have some problem with transparency. Uh, you can make them more transparent, but the nice thing of 3D printing is that now you can make the design in 3D. So far we have seen channel which are flat. If you use 3D printers, then you can have way more space used in three dimension. This is interesting also for having better mixer, because if you want to have uh, two liquids that are mixing together, having three dimensional channel is always better than have a flat channel. And again, using 3D printer, you need, you need just to design and 3D print. So it's as simple as it sounds. The problem is that you never know which material are you using. Because you can buy the material, but they rarely tell you, uh, they rarely tell you which material it is. So chemically, you have no idea how this will react. There is another thing that you can do with 3D printer, and actually it's printing the master itself. So before we have seen that you can make the master with lithography, but actually you can 3D print the master. Let me see if you can see this, but apparently not. So again, I will take a new lens and I will show you how to uh, how those master looks. 3D printed microfluidics. Um, this one actually you can see it from here, so it's quite big as you can see. Hard plastic, again two inlets and one outlet. So this one, it's also another um, mixer and for making a reaction, for making a reaction and uh, nothing really to say here. You can see this pretty clear. As you can see, it's not fully transparent. So I cannot use those one for microscopy, for example, because I cannot see anything through those. But with the 3D printer, I can actually make uh, molds for PDMS. So instead of using the lithography and making all the difficult steps with lithography, I can just use a 3D printer for making those, uh, the master for PDMS on glass or PDMS on PDMS. So you can see here, those one are linear channels or just a single straight channel, but I can put five or six of them on a single slide. That was the, the that was why we designed those kind of channels. You can see this one. This one, it's a little bit smaller and probably you cannot see, uh, maybe you can. Uh, you can barely see. Let's again put this lens on top. And now you can see, this is one inlet, this is the other inlet, and then you have a long outlet. This is again was 3D printed, but this is now 200 microns. So the new SLA printer have a really good resolution for reaching those kind of sizes. So in those cases, I put PDMS on it, I cure the PDMS, I remove the PDMS, and then I attach them on glass. But I use the 3D printer instead of using uh, lithography, which is quite nice. So in this case, I'm not printing the final microfluidic device, but I'm printing the master. So it means that I again, again put PDMS on top, cure the PDMS, remove it and, attaching, and attach it directly on glass or, or another piece of PDMS. So this also simplifies a lot um, the master fabrication. Those ones were done with SLA and master SLA. So both of them are working and have a precision uh, that you can use for making masters. So, 3D printed microfluidic device, pros and cons. Then, a few years ago, we were thinking, okay, you can use a 3D printer for making either the master of the microfluidics device, but I told you, um, the material is always kind of random, which one, uh, which material you can get from different vendors. 
On the other hand, we know a lot about PDMS. PDMS was studied for more than 20 years. We know extremely well how the PDMS behave. So we are thinking, can we make the 3D printer working with PDMS? And we developed this method that it's called, actually we call the escargot, which is a method scaffold removing uh, open technology. And you print uh, ABS with a normal FDM printer, so with a really standard FDM printer, also standard material. Then you put it inside the liquid PDMS, you cure it, and then you leave everything in acetone. The acetone will dissolve the ABS, but not the PDMS. So this will leave you uh, a channel inside the single block of PDMS, something like this. Still see this? This is now a monolithic block of PDMS, so it's completely flexible, it's practically indestructible, and you made this one without using um, without using lithography, without using um, harsh chemicals, without using plasma. This is something practically uh, you can do in any laboratory without any um, specific instrument. Just a 3D printer and acetone, and naturally PDMS. I will pick up the lens and I will show you those one in a few minutes because first I want to show you what you can do. Um, we also make a video. This video is also interesting to watch for understanding the method. Hopefully we will manage to do this one in the laboratory at the university if we have the possibility of going to the laboratory in, uh, in a few weeks. Interesting things of those is that you can make uh, 3D design, again, because we are using a 3D printer, so you can make really complex structure inside a single block of PDMS, but also you can make something that other method cannot make. So this one, for example, it's a channel encompassed, no, you cannot see. This is, for example, a heating coil uh, around a microfluidic channel, and you can make uh, some channel, so some electronics embedded in the PDMS with a microfluidics on top. Again, I will show you this in one minute. And as I told you, we have the escargot method. You can see the channel here. This is a single block of PDMS. This has not been PDMS on PDMS. So it means that it can be completely uh, three-dimensional because I don't need two flat surfaces for attaching one on top of the other. And I can make something really um, strange, like this channel is... So here you have um, a heating coil around the channel. I don't know if you can see it properly. Uh, this is something that you cannot do with practically any other methodology. Or you can make, but it's really difficult. And, as I told you, you can have electronics embedded in the PDMS with the channel on top. So what you see here is... Huh, let me take my classical spaghetto. What you see here is, again, a colorimetric sensor, but at this point it's on the bottom of this channel. So I can check the color of this channel by using an Arduino. This is an Arduino Nano, or a micro. No, this is an Arduino Nano, this is a colorimetric sensor, and I can just use this one for checking the flow. Again, it's a PDMS, so it means that it's also indestructible compared to the glass. I can throw it from an airplane, nothing is going to happen. Um, you can make a lot of different design by using this methodology. It's extremely simple that everyone can use it and make it. This is, for example, from a high school project, and they can make those microfluidics in a really simple and easy way. This is another project I love. Uh, it was used from an artist in London, Emmy Winters, and she actually made a t-shirt with all of those channels inside, and the liquid was moving inside the channels um, with music. So, escargot, once more, pros and cons. So from this side this was it. On Friday we will have a longer discussion on all those methodology. Hopefully in the lab we will manage to make the escargot and um, we can have a final slide on 
which is the best method for what. Thank you and see you next week. No, see you on Friday. See you on Friday.